Okay, gang, let's take a look at another confidence interval together. And, and like always, I think the first thing to do is to figure out what land you're in. Am I in mean land or am I in proportion land? Or you could frame that as, do I have a numerical variable or a categorical variable? So let's read through this. And while I'm reading, try and be on the listen for what land am I in. So it says, a study of the ability of individuals to walk in a straight line reported the following data on cadence, strides per second, for a sample of 20 randomly selected healthy men. And here's all these data values, and it says construct an 80% confidence interval. All right, so I want you to think, these, this was my sample, right? I have a sample of 20 uh, healthy men. Okay, great. What was I keeping track of for these men? What was the variable here? And if you look, you see a bunch of data here, all right? You take a look, all right, there's my data, there's my 20 numbers, right? First off, I'm seeing numbers. So that makes me think I've got a numerical variable, so maybe I'm in mean land. Next thing I see here is strides per second, so I see some units. All right, as soon as I see units, that's another clue that I'm in mean land. A third clue that I'm in mean land is if you take a look at some of these data values, right? like this one specifically, 1.05, that's larger than one, and every proportion that we're gonna deal with in this class is stuck between zero and one. So while that could have been a proportion, that could have been a proportion, this is not a proportion, right? This is 1.05, so that's yet another clue that I'm in mean land, and really the variable here is cadence, all right? And cadence, if you haven't heard of that word before, it's just how fast are you walking? How many strides do you take per second? So we've got some healthy men taking almost one stride per second. Some of them are walking a little faster than one stride per second. But ultimately, I'm in mean land. All right, so I know I'm going to use a T star distribution, okay? Or I should say a T star critical value. And this says construct an 80% confidence interval, all right? So based off of these 20 guys, I want to see if I can estimate the, the true mean, what's the, the true mean if I had ran, run a census on this? So here's, I can find my sample mean in a moment, but I, I wanna try and estimate the parameter. All right, so we've got a confidence interval to do. And if we look a couple pages back, here's our general workflow, right? Same as proportion land. Check the assumptions, then write me a title, construct the interval, and then interpret it, okay? You always have to interpret the confidence interval, only interpret the level if I ask you for it. All right, so with that aside, if you're not remembering what the assumptions are, I want to refer us to my, our, our flow chart for the rest of this semester, this bad boy. Now, we had taken a look at this when we had confidence intervals for proportions down here, but now I want us to look at confidence intervals for means. All right, and here's where we'll start. We'll start with our, random, or with our assumptions. And the first assumption is that did I have a random sample or did I have a sample that represents the population? Okay, so I'll check. Now this is not the deal breaker, all right? Number two is the deal breaker, but we'll get to that in a moment. So let's go see if we had a random sample or if my sample represented my population. So if I look through this, I see I've got a random sample. So let me just start in here with my assumptions. All right, so I've got a random sample. And I'm going to put a check mark there. All right, fantastic. Random sample, done. All right, the next one is normality. And this is the example where we're going to introduce the new way to figure out if your sampling distribution is normal. And I know I'm on a sampling distribution because you can see I have a random sample. So I'm on a sampling distribution for means, just like we were in chapter 10, not chapter 10, chapter 7. So let's see was my population distribution given as normal? So I'm gonna check. Was there anything about my distribution being normal in here? I don't see any phrasing seeing I, this is coming from a normal distribution. All right, so I didn't, I didn't get normality that way, which is fine. All right, if not, if it's not stated, use the central limit theorem as long as your sample size is 30 or higher. Okay, well, can I use the central limit theorem? I can't, I only had a sample of size 20. So stats folks ran into this all the time. We were like, well, what do we do when our sample isn't 30 or higher and we still wanna get a confidence interval? So a third way, the new way to assess normality or at least approximate normality when you're in mean land is this. 
you can make a plot of these data for plausible normality, i.e. relatively little skewness or no outliers. So this seems kind of vague, make a plot. We have a couple of options. We could make a histogram, we could make a stem and leaf plot, we can make a box plot. So any of those numerical plots we picked up in chapter two, we can make in here. Now I'm gonna make one on my calculator. My calculator is capable of doing a histogram and a box plot. And I'm also gonna introduce this third one called the normal probability plot. So let's go ahead. I'm gonna get this data into my lists, but I'm gonna pause here for a moment and I'm gonna flip over to my calculator, my computer calculator, so you can see how I'm doing this but I'll catch back up with you in just a sec. Hey Math 43, I wanna to talk to you about this third and new way to assess normality in Meanland. So back in chapter seven, we had picked up if, um, if you're in Meanland and the population distribution is stated as normal, then you know the sampling distribution for averages is normal. Or if the sample size was 30 or higher, you knew that the central limit theorem kicked in and the sampling distribution for averages is normal. So we ran into this situation all the time in stats where we, we were looking at numerical variables, but we didn't have enough observations in our sample to guarantee um, the central limit theorem to kick in. So this workaround that we came up with is um, how we started to use the T distribution, where we said, well, if you're approximately normal, um, we'll use a T star critical value. It has a little bit more variability, a little wider margin of error but we're okay with it. And we became a little looser with how we assess normality. So this third new option is, can you create some kind of stat plot that shows um, your sample data is roughly symmetric? And if it's roughly symmetric, then it's plausible. It came from a population distribution that was normal. So there are really three main plots that we use. I tend to favor the box plot, so you'll see me use that one a lot more often, but let me show them to you. So I've got my data here on my list, had it there the whole time. I'm gonna go into my stat plots. Let's see what I left it on. Um, I actually left it on a normal probability plot. I'll get to that third. So let me just go in here and change the type down to, let's go to a histogram, first of all. So since I have every data value um, in my list exactly once, I'll keep the frequency at one. And if I hit zoom nine, you can see there's a histogram. It looks roughly symmetric, it almost, could look like a bell curve. And we're pretty liberal with it. We're like, well, it's roughly symmetric. We're willing to roll the die and use a T distribution. If those rectangles seemed a little too wide for you and you're like, well, I'm really not sure what that looks like, you can always reduce the size of your rectangles. Like maybe instead of 0.056, I'll go 0.045. I'm just making these numbers up as I go along. Well, you can see there, ooh, I can't even quite see the the top part of my histogram because my Y values got a little too large. Um, just to chop that down, maybe I'll go, let's go 0.04. Let's see what happens when I make a rectangle every 0.04 units. There you go, you got, again, now I can see it because the frequency count isn't gonna be so high. So I've got something roughly symmetric. I'm good, I'm good with that. Um, like I said, I tend to use a box plot. So you'll see a lot of this on my write-ups. Uh, I like the box plots because they show you the outliers right out the gate as long as you're modifying them. And really, I don't stop problems unless I have severe skewness or an outlier present. And this is great. This is roughly symmetric, so I'm definitely gonna go forward with it. The third type of plot that you could make is something called a normal probability plot. And it is this sixth plot right here. It's the only one we haven't gotten to. So let me go down into type and head to the right and um, activate that. And you can see there's all sorts of fun things that pop up and just stay with the default, you'll be fine. When you make a normal probability plot, all of your data values have been normalized, put on a standard normal curve and some magic has happened that I won't go into. Um, it's not worth it. Basically what we're looking for is a plot that looks like a line. So let me hit zoom nine and that looks pretty linear, which believe it or not tells us that our, our data it's very plausible that it came from a population distribution that was normal. So any of these plots are great. I tend to go with a box plot. You can see it right there. I just took a screenshot of that box plot. That's by far the one I use the most often, but I just want you to hear that you're welcome to use as many as you want. 
So with that, we're going to flip back and finish up um, writing out the word, uh, writing up this FRQ. All right, see you. Bye. Okay, so we're back. Let's review up how we would assess normality when you have a small sample size. And again, this happens all the time. So this is our, our plan for it. So I've got my data in my lists. Let me go ahead and make a plot. So go into your second and y equals, and I can just see from this calculator, it looks like the last time I turned this one on, I had a histogram L1 against L2. I don't want to deal with that right now. So I'm going to go ahead, and if you leave it on a histogram, make sure you change this back to 1, because we've put all of our data values in there. All right, if I hit zoom 9, that's looking roughly symmetric as a histogram. All right, if I wanted to, I could adjust the window. I could say, hey, make me a rectangle, maybe every 0.025. Um, units so that I could get a better idea of what that looked like, but it's still looking roughly symmetric. And again, we're going to be pretty liberal with this idea of roughly symmetric. And as I go through these problems, personally, I don't use the histogram as often. I happen to like the box plot. Oops, so let me go into here. All right, I'll turn this plot on. I tend to like the modified box plot. All right, so if I hit zoom nine, you can now see there's my histogram, there's my box plot. And again, I will typically just use the box plot. Uh, but just so we can see this, I do want to try one more. Let me turn this histogram off. All right, and let me adjust this box plot to the normal probability plot, just so you can see that. When it's the normal probability plot, what you're hoping is that you see a line. And believe it or not, that's a pretty, that's a relatively good line. It looks like a nice straight line. So all of these graphs are indicating that it is plausible this data, this sample of healthy men, came from a population that was normally distributed. And like I said, I personally like the box plot. I guess I have this on plot too. So I'm gonna just default here, okay? And then what I need from you is I need you to sketch this box plot onto your write-up. So I'm just gonna go here and I'm gonna say, well, I have a box plot, all right? It looks, as I look over, it looks something like that, that seems close enough, okay? So I would say my box plot is roughly symmetric. With no outliers, which is great. All right, so I'm gonna put a little check here, right? I am getting approximate normality here. It is possible, or it's totally plausible that if this is roughly symmetric for my data, right, my 20 data values look roughly symmetric, it's plausible this came from a normal distribution. We're willing, oops, excuse me, we're willing to take that risk and take that leap in stats. We'll be on the T distribution anyway, so it'll be a little bit, we'll have a little larger margin of error just because we're taking that risk. But there you go. And pretty much the only time I ever stop the problem is when this is severely skewed or has an outlier. Okay. And really, the more observations you have, like we only have the 20 here, but the closer you get to 30, right, 27, 28, 29 observations, the less the skewness makes a difference because it's so hard to move averages. All right. Anyways, that's only the second assumption. I've still got another one to do. So this is asking me for the value of the sample standard deviation S, right? And you may need technology to calculate this value. And it might seem foreign right now, but we've done this a bunch. If I want the sample standard deviation for this data set, all I gotta do is run one of our stats. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we got. I have my data in L1. So when I run one of our stats, I can see the sample standard deviations right there at 0.081. And just keep in mind, we never use this sigma line. All right, so I've got my sample standard deviation. Just so you know, the units for this are the units for your variable. So this is 0 0.081 strides per second. Okay. All right. So what we've done so far is we've gotten through the assumptions. The next thing we want to do is make our title. All right. So we've got our assumptions. I'm going to put my title under this. So let's talk about how many samples do we have, what land are we in, and what letter are we using, right? So samples, land, letter. All right, in terms of the number of samples, I only took the one sample. 
Admittedly, I have 20 folks in my sample. My sample size is 20, but I only ran this experiment once. Oh, and I'm just noticing, typically I write the number of samples in my margins here. Looks like I forgot to do that. And while we're in chapters eight and nine, it'll always be one sample. Chapter 10 will be two samples, and then 11 and 13 are three or more. All right, so I have one sample. I am in mainland, and I'm going to use a T star confidence interval, okay? And as soon as I hear T star, I, I think it's a good idea to start looking for my degrees of freedom, all right? So degrees of freedom was always sample size minus one. So if my sample size is 20, I have 19 degrees of freedom. And we will use that in a moment when we go find our T star critical value. All right, so the next thing I need to do is I need to actually construct that confidence interval. And if I go back to that template or that, that um, organizer that I have, that flowchart, here it is. So I'm gonna use this formula, X bar plus or minus a T star times S over square root N. So, so far, in terms of numbers I know I can plug in, we found S, it was right over here, right? We found it in our assumption, it was 0.081. We know N is 20. I can actually get X bar from my one var stats as well, so I see it's 0.926. The only thing I'm gonna need is my T star critical value. So let's, let's go find this. Keep in mind, I've got the 80% confidence level, and I have 19 degrees of freedom. So let's go try and find this. Um, I do have a column for 80%. I see it right in here, so that's fantastic. So I'm gonna cross this column of 80% with 19 degrees of freedom. So when I do that, when I look real close there, I can see it is 1.328. Okay, so I've got 1.328 as my critical value. So with all of that, I'm just I'm gonna write my numbers. So I'm gonna say this was 0.926 plus or minus 1 point, well, it looks like I might run into my other line. Let me just erase this and space it out a little bit better. Okay, so we've got 0.926 plus or minus, my T star was 1.328, my S was 0.081, and I'm gonna divide by that square root of 20, okay? All right, so as I'm going through this, let's do it the long way, and then I'm gonna to flip to my calculator for a bit. So when I say the long way, let me go figure out what my margin of error is. So I would take 1.328, I would multiply it by 0.081, and I would divide by the square root of 20. And I'm looking at about 0.024. So I'm looking at about 0.926 plus or minus 0.024, okay? So let me see what that gets us. So it looks like my margin of error, my, uh, yeah, my margin of error is 0.024 strides per second. So let's do 0.926 plus that number. It looks like I'm at 0 0.95. If I'm going three decimals, I'll do 950. Let me do 0 0.926 minus 0.024. It looks like I have about 0.902. All right, so I'm feeling like that's, that's not too bad. That's gonna be my confidence interval. So here we go. I always write low to high. Okay, so that's where we think the, the parameter, the mean actually is. The average cadence is somewhere in here. So I'm gonna pause for a moment. We're gonna go take a look at how I could have crunched this entire thing on my calculator. We'll come back, interpret it, and draw a graph to go with it. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Hey, Math43, let's take a look at how we can run this type of problem on our calculator. Um, so just to review up, if you wanted to make a box plot, I know I went over that um, when we were going by hand, but you could always turn your plots on, right? 
and then we always modify our box plots. My data is in L1. I should have started with, I already put my data into L1. And since I put every single one of these values, all 20 of them into L1, I'm going to keep the frequency at 1 and just hit zoom 9. So there's, there's my box plot, again, roughly symmetric, no outliers, so that's, we're good to go there. But in terms of getting the confidence interval, um, go ahead and hit stat, go to tests. Uh, so I just want to make sure I mention this. Hold on, wait for it. We've got to let this thing catch up. So your intervals are on menu items 7 through B. We're in mean land. So the implication here is if you see the word prop, P-R-O-P, that stands for proportion. So we don't want to use those because we are not in proportion land. And again, our calculator, I really wish they were, wrote the word mean here, but they don't. So okay, we need to just infer that if we don't see the word prop, we're in mean land. And then on top of that, if we don't see the number 2, like we don't on 7 and 8, that we're in one sample mean land. So we are doing a one sample mean confidence interval. So we are either at 7 or 8, but we only know the sample standard deviation s, so we're going to do a t interval. And again, in this class, we're only going to construct t mean intervals. So if you're doing a mean confidence interval, we're going to go t. The only time I'll have us deal with the z-star critical value is when we're doing the margin of error problems. And that's just to make it easier, believe it or not. Um, and it would actually be very incorrect to use a z interval here. Uh, no statistician should say, go ahead and use the z interval. The sample size is way too small. You're definitely not guaranteed that you're on the sampling distribution um, that's approximately normal. We're on the t distribution. It's still approximately normal, but we're not on the um, sampling distribution we talked about in chapter 7. We're on the t distribution. The tails are a little higher. The peak is a little lower. So we're going to go with option 8. Now, I actually have raw data this time, so I'm going to go make the data um, menu live. You can see it's got the black background now. I did put my data into L1. This was asking me for the 80% confidence interval. So I'm going to head down here. Now you can type in 80 or 0 0.80. I always typed in 0 0.80, but you could just type in 80 if you wanted to, and your calculator would know what that meant. I just always, I, I, I'm a math teacher, I can't put a percentage in as um, as anything but a decimal. So I'm going to go down and hit calculate. And there it is. There's my confidence interval, right? 0 0.901, 0 0.950. And that's what I got in here. And the, the great thing about this calculator output is that the three numbers that are here are literally the three number, three of the four numbers that you need for your write-up. So I could get x bar just from this calculator menu. I don't actually have to run one bar stats. Right? I could get S from this calculator menu, right? and I can get N from the calculator, uh, the menu, I should say the calculator output. So a lot of times what I'll do when I'm asked to create a confidence interval, right, an estimate, or when we get to chapter 9 and 10, if I'm asked to run a hypothesis test, is I, I do the technology first. Um, I'll, I'll see what the, the answer is, and then I'll use that information, my technology output, to do my write-up. So you'll see me a lot of times talk about reverse engineer our, our write-up, meaning cut to the chase, get the confidence interval right out the gate, and then use all of that information, use that output screen to, to do your write-up. All right, so that's what we got for creating a confidence interval when you have raw data. All right, thanks gang, bye. All right, so now that we took a look at that, let me just run this from my calculator one more time. Right, I would do stat, tests. I'm down here at the T interval. I actually had data this time. It was in L1. I wanted an 80% confidence level. I go down and hit calculate, and I get something pretty darn close to what I have. You can see I'm slightly off. I had a decimal round off error here because I had 0 0.902, and this was technically 0 0.091 or 0 0.901, and you can see where it's getting close to rounding. Because this is 47, that's getting close to 50. If this was 50, it would have rounded up to 902. And you can see the 9495 does round up. And just to stay consistent, I'll go ahead and write this as 901. It's not that big of a difference, but I just want to take the calculator answer because it's that much more accurate. And another thing I just want you to notice coming off of this calculator output screen 
there's my mean, there's my standard deviation, and there's my sample size. So the three numbers that I really needed for this come off of my calculator's output screen, meaning I didn't actually need to run one variable stats at the beginning. I could have just ran this T interval right out the gate with this problem and then use this calculator output screen to help me with my write-up. And that, that's typically what I do. I actually do all the calculator, the technology first, and then I'll go through and do my write-up. All right, so I wanna just show you graphically what's happening and then we'll go interpret it, okay? So if I was to draw a graph of this, this sampling distribution, it kicks back a bit to chapter seven. So we've got X bar happening out here, right? This is the average cadence. It's still in strides per second. Okay. I'm centered here at 0.926 and I'm going to go up to about 95 down to about 901 And that will basically cover the middle 80% of my observations. That's what an 80% confidence interval is saying. All right, I will cover about 80% of the area under that curve, and that's why I think the mean is in there somewhere. I'm 80% confident that the mean is in there. All right, so this is all fine and good, but we're, we're still, we're not done. All right, we've got to interpret the interval. All right, so let's work on interpreting this interval. We have a template over here. All right, so it says here, we are blank percent confident, so we would say 80% confident, okay, that mu, the true average or true mean, in this case, it was cadence, of healthy men is between, and then what was our lower number? It was, okay, it was 0.901 strides per second and 0.950 strides per second. So I'm gonna go ahead and write all of that out, right? 95% goes in here, mean cadence of healthy men goes in here, 901 strides per second, 950 strides per second. So let's, let's go ahead and get that sentence written out. So we are 80% confident that mu, hold on, I think I'm going out of view. Let me scooch this up so we can see it. All right, that mu, the true mean cadence of healthy men is between, where were we, 0 0.901 strides per second Upper bound was 0 0.950 strides per second. Okay, so that's it. I think if if I ran the census, my parameters would be somewhere between 0 0.9, basically 0 0.90 and 0 0.95. That's what my estimate is. That's my confidence interval estimate. All right. So with that. Let's rework this, but now let's construct a 92% confidence interval. So the upside of this is that all of this, these assumptions stay the same, all right? So my assumptions don't change. My title doesn't change. This doesn't change much except here, right? What's gonna change is gonna be my, my T star critical value, all right? And even when I get to my interpretation, it's pretty much gonna be the same. All right, what would change on the graph is this, this would extend more, right? Instead of going 80% or having 10% here, 10% here, right? This is the 10th and 90th percentile. I'm actually gonna go a little bit wider, right? We'll go 92, 
So we'll have 4% on a side. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a little bit. All right, so the only thing that changes now is this T star critical value. So let me go rewrite this formula. And then let's talk about how to find the T star critical value when you're constructing a 92% confidence interval. So I'm gonna push that up. All right, and let's see if we could get this one done. So my formula is still X bar plus or minus T star times S over square root N. Okay, so let's go to our table and see what we gotta do. All right, so I want a 92% confidence interval. I still have 19 degrees of freedom, but I think you can see the problem we're running into, right? I have a column for 90% confidence and I have a column for 95%, and I don't have one for 92. But let's go get an idea of what the 92 would be. So I'm gonna go up the 90 and 95 column because 92 is trapped in between those numbers. So let's just see what the critical values are at the 90 level and the 95%. And we're looking at 90, uh, 19 degrees of freedom. So do you see here, I had 1.328 for that. Oops, no, that can't be it. We gotta go to 90 and 95, excuse me. Let me go to these two. Here's 90 and 95. So the 90% confidence level gives a critical value of 1.729. The 95% gives 2.093. Okay, let's just take their average real quick to get an idea. Now you can't just take an average. It's not statistically perfect that way, but at least it'll give us an estimate. So I'm gonna do 1.729 plus 2.093, and 92% is kind of in the middle of 90 and 95. So I think my critical value letter is somewhere around 1.9, okay? Now, this is not solid stats. I just wanna give you an idea, right? It's somewhere between these two. I think it's actually pretty, uh, a little bit closer to 1.7 because 92% is technically closer to 90% than it is to 95. All right, but we need a real way to be able to do this, okay? So the real way involves inverse T. And so let's get an idea of how we get this critical value letter, okay? Or not critical value letter, excuse me, critical value number. All right, like so. All right, so let's say I'm on the T star distribution, or the T distribution, excuse me, not T star. We usually use T stars when we're getting our critical values. Um, and this was for 19 degrees of freedom. So that's pretty common notation in stats that we write T with its subscriptive degrees of freedom. All right, zero is under the peak, just like the standard normal curve. And what I wanna do is I wanna trap the middle 92% of my data. So I wanna figure out what number is right here. This is the T star value I want. I wanna have the middle 92% of my data. Now, it would be great if all of our calculators could cr crunch the middles. And like I said in the last, uh, when we were doing this type of idea back in example nine, I think the newer calculators actually can do this. My calculator can't. And that's all fine and good. All right, we got a workaround. Okay, so I want the middle 92% of my data this time out. If I want the middle 92%, that's awesome, but my calculator is built in percentiles. So we have to figure out what percentile is here and what percentile is here. So this is how we work it. We know if there's 92% in the middle and there's 100% total, that means there's 8% outside this shaded area. But through symmetry, I know there's 4% on a side. So there is 4% here and 4% here. All right, now your calculator works in percentiles. So let's start remembering how we work percentiles. And this is what we do, all right? If I was to put my ruler here, what area under the curve is from here on down? From here left, do you see this is 4%, right? This right here is the fourth percentile. Now, if I go from the fourth percentile and I add another 92%, what percentile am I living here? What area is from here on down? So if I was to shade all of this area from here on down, I would shade the middle 2% plus another 4%. So what percentile is here? That is the 96th percentile. Okay. 
Okay, so the middle 92% is cut off by the fourth and 96th percentile, right? Lower bound, upper bound. So that's awesome. What we need to do here in order to find this number is we need to use inverse T. All right, we've used inverse norm when we were on the standard normal curve when we had Z scores. We don't have Zs right now, we have Ts, so use inverse T. And your calculator needs two things. It needs a percentile and it needs degrees of freedom. Okay, so in terms of inverse T, I need degrees, or it was like I said, percentile and degrees of freedom. Now, because there's a plus or minus here, it doesn't really matter if you get the fourth percentile or the 96th percentile. These are gonna be mirror images of one another. They're just gonna be opposite in sign. So typically we get the higher one. So here's what we're gonna do for our particular problem. We're gonna say T star is inverse T. I want the 96th percentile and I have 19 degrees of freedom. So let's see what number is coming out of that. Okay. And remember, what was our estimate? I think I just had it before. Let me divide that by two. It was 1.911. Let's see how close we got. So I'm gonna hit second in bars. All right, and then I'm gonna scroll down to inverse T. I'm gonna type in 0.96 comma 19. Let's see how close we got. Wait for it. All right, one point looks like 850. So uh, not too far off, but actually not super close either. That's why it's better to do it exactly on the calculator. So this is gonna be 1.850. All of this ultimately means I know what number I'm putting here. All right, so if you remember from our example, our average cadence was 0.926 strides per second. I'm gonna use my new T star critical value of 1.850. I'm gonna multiply that by my sample standard deviation of 0.81 and divide it by my sample size. All right, so we've got sample mean, sample standard deviation, sample size, and here is our T star critical value. All right, and now I don't think the 83s do this at all. All right, so the 83s, the best you could do, you could do inverse norm and see what you get here. And when I say the 83s could do inverse norm, I could quite literally say, hey, let's try inverse norm with 0.96, comma zero, comma one. And we're not too far off. All right, it's, it's an okay estimate. It's not the best we can do. Uh, or actually, IJK, it is the best the TI-83s can do, um, but it gets us close enough. Now, if you have the TI-83, I don't want you to worry about getting this number. If you have the 84s, we should be able to worry about getting that number. Okay. So how we're going to work this now is even if you have the TI-83 and you can't get the 1.850, we can all get the confidence interval. So we go over to Stat, Tests. We're going to go down to Option 8. And it's all this stuff all over again, except now I want the 92% confidence level. And when I do that, wait for it, it looks like I have uh, a confidence interval from about 0.892 to 0.959. Okay. And if we compare that, if I scooch this back up, and try and get this all into view. I can get a little bit of an into view. I want us to compare this interval and this interval, right? So we went from 80% to 92%, and you can see when we increased our confidence level, our interval got wider. And we saw that in proportion land too. So increase our confidence interval, our, or excuse me, increase our confidence level, the interval got wider, okay? So that's what we got on that front. We're gonna work a few multiple choice questions right now um, and see how we're doing with our calculators. All right, gang, see you in a bit. Bye. Hey, Math43ers, before we get out of this problem, I just wanna run through the 92% confidence interval on our calculators. So it's basically the same thing as the 80%. So I'm gonna hit stat. This time we're going over to tests. And once you scroll down, or you could just hit the number, uh, Give, give my computer a sec, it's a little bit delayed. Uh, just to reiterate, as we're in all of these intervals, you see seven through B are most of your intervals. If you don't see the word proportion written somewhere, like on seven, eight, nine, and zero, then it's implied that you're in mean land. And in mean land, if you don't see the number two, which you don't on seven or eight, it's implied that you have one sample. So we could narrow it down between a Z and a T interval. But because we had such a small sample size, we only had 20 folks in our, our experiment, 
um, we, we need to do a T interval. Uh, the T distribution, again, it's a little bit more variable. It gives us a slightly larger margin of error, and it's what we need right now because we have a small sample size. So I need to do stat tests eight. All right, and again, we had data that I had put into L1. The only thing I need to change in here is the confidence level. And you've seen me putting in 0.8 um, rather than 80%. I just want to show you the other option that you could just type in 92 for 92%, um, and it will work. I just as a math teacher, I have to type in 0.92 because 92% as a decimal is 0.92. But I'm going to go ahead and put a pin in that for myself right now and um, just type in 92, even though it hurts a little. Uh, and then let's hit calculate. Give it a sec, and there is our confidence interval, right, from 0.892 to 0.959, which you can see here, and that's what we got um, on our calculators when we were doing it. Uh, not on our calculators, this is on our calculator, but I mean when we were doing it by hand and we got that critical value, that T star using inverse T. And before we get out of here, I just want to reiterate um, one other thing, that when it comes to small data sets like this, you only have 20 observations, or, or basically when you have fewer than 30 observations, so the central limit theorem hasn't kicked in, and you don't have enough information about the population distribution to say it's approximately normal, when we're in that new third option where you have to make some kind of graph, we've been making a box plot. So when I go back to here, this was the, the standard thing I tend to make. And basically, if there's no outliers in that, right, I look at it, it's roughly symmetric. I get that it looks a little bit skewed, maybe a little skewed left, but it's, it's pretty good. It's roughly symmetric. And, and the key thing is that there's no outliers. Um, then I just move forward with the problem. Now I'm going to give you a couple other options. I want you to see a different plot, and we'll actually compare them back to back. So oh, let me turn this on, and this time let's make it a histogram. All right, so if I do that one, you can see both of these here hanging out. Now the histogram looks roughly symmetric. I can kind of see the bell in that, so that's another indication that it's okay. If you weren't sure about the bell, you could always make your rectangle smaller. I could turn the window. It looks like I'm making a rectangle every 0.05 units. Maybe I go to 0.04, make that a smaller number. Let's see what we get here. It's looking still roughly symmetric. There's something going on over here. The left tail is a little high, but again, roughly symmetric, right? If I look, that's kind of a bell curve. And that's fine too. If you prefer histograms, great. Just keep in mind, if you're going with the histograms, you're going to have to do the one and a half IQRs and all of that and find out if there are outliers present. Um, the third option that you have that I don't use that often, it's not my favorite. Let me turn this off and go back into plot one and edit plot one. Um, you have the normal probability plot. Okay. And basically, when you do this graph, it just, it, it should look like a line. And as I go through there, it looks pretty linear. It, it's, it's not too shabby. So we, again, would go through and say, hey, I think it's plausible that my, my sample data came from a population that was um, normally distributed. And you can get all sorts of funky things on here. Like you can see all sorts of weird patterns. So this is a pretty linear one. All right, gang, that's going to wrap it up for example 10. I will see you in a bit. Bye.